I would like to begin with a sincere thank you to Dr. Davis, Dean Charney, Mr. May, members of the Board of Trustees, faculty, family, and fellow graduates. When I think about the common denominator in the degrees being earned today, I think about how each and every one of us had to learn how to approach a huge and totally overwhelming body of knowledge. Science, with a capital S. To do that, we all quickly learn to triage information, to sacrifice the important for the most important. We learn to wait for that last magic PowerPoint slide, the slide that would reveal the five take-home or high-yield points of a 60-minute lecture. Since I have six minutes instead of 60, I'm going to start on that last slide with my top two take-home messages at the end of four transformational years. I have paired each with a quote. Take-home point number one. In the world of existence, there is indeed no greater power than the power of love. Abdu'l-Baha. On the first day of my medicine rotation, I was assigned a patient, Mr. J.H., a 19-year-old with cerebral palsy, bed-bound, intubated since childhood, tube-fed nonverbal, and here for his 15th case of pneumonia and seizures. I was filled to the brim with disappointment. Surely my resident was trying to punish me for some reason. There was nothing I could learn from this depressing case. I couldn't even do a physical exam or take a history. This was not a good teaching case, I kept thinking. Begrudgingly, I walked into Mr. J.H.'s room and tried my best to cover my disappointment, wondering what our goal for treating him even was. I found this young man obscured by plastic with two women by his side, one suctioning his mouth and the other stroking his leg. His mother turned to me and said she knew something was wrong before he started seizing because he had a single tear in his left eye, which is always what happens when something's bothering him. The woman on his other side chimed in, yes, also, he moved his head to the left, and that is how I know he's in pain. They went on to tell me how he postures his legs when he is angry, the different kinds of grunts that mean laughter or fatigue or calm. In these women's descriptions of this young man and the way they tended to his needs, I realized in an instant that I knew absolutely nothing of a love like this. That this man's life, which would normally only come up in difficult ethical sessions on medical expenditures and quality of life management, perhaps had a purpose much beyond his own achievements. I watched how he, not in spite of, but because of his condition, catalyzed in these women the growth of a divine patience, a humble steadfastness, an astute knowing that no number of hours in the library could have yielded. How his life fueled their purpose, which I believe is all of our purposes in the end, and that is to cultivate our capacity to love. Take home point number two. When does the wind blow? And in what direction do you turn to when it rains? Carolyn Rogers. Especially on days like these, when it is easy to gloat in our success, to feel affirmed by accolades and the pedestal we're being placed on, we could so easily shake off the truth of how we cracked open to get here how we didn't choose not even once when the wind would blow or which impetus would cause us to crack. For me, unfortunately, it was step one, my boards. I entered a dark and self-loathing place and none of my normal coping skills seemed to work. One day I called my grandmother in a desperate state and told her everything I was thinking and feeling. After a long silence on the phone, she said, I'm happy for you, Sonia. What, I thought, 
Does she not hear me? No, Gams, I said I have never felt so sad and incapable in my life. She said, I know, Son, and I'm happy for you. She went on to tell me she thought it was imperative that I feel this profound a feeling of powerlessness. That though I would never tell my patients of the future that this was my reference point, having this experience would mean that rather than feeling pity or judgment, I would know in a microscopic way what a heaviness comes with that sentiment and how it knows no reason. My heart, by being cracked, would be more open, and more open, my capacity to heal more pronounced. I have watched my colleagues struggle through different parts of this process, mastering biostats or genome ma mapping, not getting published, watching their first patient pass away, finding that perfect research mentor, having to set an alarm in the middle of the night to go back to lab again to incubate tubes or harvest cells, and deciding whether or not they should be honest and include this in their frequent activities on their OkCupid profile. I have watched us all be cracked, and in that cracking, a posture of humility has been born. We have been forced to reconsider our sense of self and reestablish which direction we turn to when it rains. Now, for me, two of many take-home points may be about love as a fuel for knowledge and the beauty in cracking open. But I know that each of my colleagues has their own version of these moments, from the hospital halls, from the labs, from the global health projects they went on. What I think is most valuable here is not actually the points themselves, but the realization that as we move out of lecture halls, and into our respective professions, we are no longer just passive recipients of what someone else thinks is important. We are becoming researchers and counselors, physicians and educators, policy makers and advocates, earning the burden and the privilege of deciding what the imperative focus will be. Science a mode through which truth is sought and objectified, is being turned to in the most pivotal of times to determine what matters. As people of science, we will have to own the accountability that comes with that. In the research questions we choose to fund, in the cases we choose to teach, in the policies we choose to challenge and change, we are now really saying this is the take-home message. This is what matters most right now. When we state that mass incarceration is a public health issue, that gender inequality is not founded in biology, when we state that black lives matter and racism is pathology, and perhaps more importantly when we don't, what we are really doing is choosing what is important and pursuing and interrogating and propelling our collective values and understanding of truth accordingly. I will be forever humbled and grateful to have started this journey with the people who fill this room. And I only hope we move forward, aware of our privilege, using our individual craft to advance the collective, ever in our humble posture of learning, leading the pursuit of truth, head with heart. Thank you.